you will be saved. But Jesus was talking about his death. While they thought that he meant ordinary sleep. So then Jesus said to them, Fear, Lazarus has died. And I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. So Thomas, called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go to die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Mother said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Mother said to me, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary secretly, saying, The teacher is here and is asking for you. As soon as she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. For Jesus had not yet come in the village, but was still where mother had met him. So when the Jews who were with her in the house comforted her, so Mary came up quickly and go out, they followed her. Presuming that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he became tired and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that <clears throat> this man would not have died? So Jesus, part of the dead, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. 
Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stink. He has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tried, tied hand and foot with the barrel of bands. And his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to men and seen what he had done began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. during the day, he does not stone. 
He sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles. If one walks during the day, and one can see where one is going, he can walk straight, even in the midst of obstacles and things over which you have to contend with, with which you have to contend. But in this walk that we have today and in our life, it seems to me in this gospel there are three verses that serve as guideposts, sort of waypoints along the way that we can fix our attention on, over which we can walk, it will help us to get to our goal, who is ultimately Christ. Because Christ is the light which allows us to walk. He is the day. He is the dawn. The east. First verse. Master, the one we love is ill. The context of the entire gospel, the context of today's readings in the Lenten context, the context of today's celebration on the fifth Sunday of Lent in our world, Master, the one who loves ill. This is on the lips of everyone in the world, literally. Master, he's ill. The context is death and suffering and pleading. In the first reading from the prophet Ezekiel, context. Thus says the Lord God, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them. I open your graves and I will have you rise from them and I will put my spirit in you that you may live. This is the, the reality in which everything is situated, not only in the scriptures, but existentially for every one of us. The song, the responsorial song, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. This is, again, the cry of someone who suffered. The depths. The fact is, is that we are in peril. The world is in peril. And the world, and each one of us, is doomed. We're all going to die. <laughs> and many already have. What we forget, though, and what we forget is that we've always been in peril. We've been in peril all along. Even while we were merrily going along on a bull market, and when everything seemed to be fine, and the weather was good, and the sailing was smooth. It, we were in peril. We forget that, and we have forgotten, that we don't have the power to overcome death by ourselves. And still, despite all of this, despite the, the fact of our predicament in our world, which is not merely a pandemic on a biological level, the deeper and more dangerous peril is that of sin. Certainly, there is physical danger. We all know that social distancing, washing your hands, don't touch your face, and all those other things. But what about the more deeper, the, the more perilous danger in which we are all engaged? As Pope Francis said so beautifully in that homily on Friday, the early Orbe, Lord, we've forgotten. We've forgotten. We ignore the wars that were going on. We, we ignore the poverty of, of so many people. We've been blind to that while we were charging forward with our own plans and our own ideas and all of those things. And yet, despite all of that, the reality is not simply death and, and 
pandemic and destruction. There is that, certainly, like the trees and the woods which surround you when you're trying to find your way. And the obstacle, yes, that exists. Yes, sin and temptation exist, clearly. And yet there's charity as well. Even in the prayer itself, even in the cry, Master, the one who loves ill, there's charity there. And we see it even on those who profess no faith at all. We can see care for our human beings. The one who loves ill, help them. As again, the Pope pointed out, first responders, people like supermarket clerks, the folks who show up and who make it possible to buy the toilet paper and stock those things that in so many ways, all of the things which make it the essential businesses to go on. And they care for others and have them. Whether they're believers or not, we can already see there, even in the midst of this, there is good and charity. We pray and we work for others. And this is imperative that we do so. Master, the one who loves is ill. But it's true also that we pray this and we must pray this for ourselves. I am ill. Master, I'm self-centered. I'm weak. I'm vain. Master, I know you love me, and the one who loves ill, the one who loves beset by so many evils, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, why am I here in the seminary? How can I help when my family's so far away? Master, the one who loves ill, help me. We can take on, and we really must, we're invited to take, to take on the voice of Mary in Cana, in Galilee. They have no wine, she said at that time. Mary says, and simply presents the needs to her son. Master, the one who loves ill. Master, they have no sacraments. Master, they have no ventilators. They have no toilet. Master, they have no food. Master, they have no priests. They have no one to pray for them. They have no one to do for them. Help us. Help me. And in this we find our place. We begin to find our place and discover our vocation and fulfill it already there in our prayer for them. And if it's not as a priest, if we're not praying for those people, the ones we know and the ones we don't. We have, if we're not praying for them, we're not helping them. When a priest is ordained, or actually when a deacon is ordained, he takes on the obligation to pray the liturgy of the hours faithfully. And the line of it in the ordination ritual is important. When you pray the liturgy of the hours faithfully for the church and the world, we take that on already. And so here, when we pray our morning prayer, the office of meetings, midday prayer, evening prayer, night prayer, we're praying not only for ourselves, or for the church and our families, but also for the world. And in so doing, we're already fulfilling that vocation. Before we go and talk to the people about God, we need to talk to God about the people. And bring them along with us, all of their needs. Master, save us. The second verse, do you believe? This is the context, this is the condition for which Jesus enters into our life. In a, in a conscious way, do you believe? He is active. He is in the world. He has created the world and he is actively in it. And he wants us to receive him so that we can receive him not merely passively, but actively. To become 
fully mature and to receive him so that we can become agents of his mercy later. In the second reading, St. Paul, writing to the Romans, says that you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the spirit, if only the spirit of God dwells in you. That's a big if. It does not mean that we have to have all sorts of ecstatic feelings or any of that. That goes to be distracting and they can be false. It's not about how, how we feel. But the fact is, are we actually believing? And if so, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. And no matter what the context is, no matter what dangers or perils, the sicknesses, the fears, or whatever comes at us from outside, or that into which we are thrust, the conditions of society, whether that be economic or political, whatever happens, that does not affect, not necessarily affect our freedom. Our freedom is not simply the absence of suffering. In fact, it's not that at all. Freedom is the ability to act well, to respond to God and as God within that situation. For freedom, Christ set you free. He says it elsewhere. And that means not freedom from pain, or freedom from danger, or freedom from uh, pandemics, or freedom from confusion or freedom from enemies, or freedom from suffering. Not at all. It means freedom in pandemics, and freedom in suffering. And you were made for this time. God made you knowing what would happen, whether it be biological or spiritual. <coughs> he made you, and it's not an accident, so that you can be free and fully free, not despite these times, but within these times. Precisely here, that he can show what that freedom looks like, what he can do. As Jesus said to the disciples, the word, by the way, believe, is used seven times in today's gospel. Seven, which is a significant number, number one, but it's, it's a lot of times. John is trying to say something to us. As Jesus said to the disciples, I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. This is so that the Son of God may be glorified. And Jesus says the same thing in the prayer. Father, I thank you. I know that you always hear me, but I said this because of the crowd, that they may believe that you sent me. Do you believe? It's a challenge to us and to say, yes, allow us Christ to work within us. It does not mean that we don't have fear or that we're not beset. It means that we trust in Jesus and we're willing to follow him. Third verse, as Jesus said to the disciples and says to us along with them, let us go to him. This is an invitation, first of all, to receive mercy, because Jesus has come. He has become man for us and for those who have died and those who are ill. It's the reason he's come. It's the reason for the incarnation. And he comes to you as well. He comes to you and to me in mercy. And that mercy, remember, is not merely forgiveness for sins, although it includes that. First and foremost, it is creation. Mercy is created before it is redemptive. God's mercy, God is mercy. Before there was sin, He is mercy. 
Mercy generates. And when there is death, it renews life. And when there's a death of sin, it forgives sin and brings new life. Jesus is mercy, but he is light and power. He is creation. He's healing. And that is why, as again, Pope Francis has said so beautifully, the privileged locus, the privileged place of the encounter with the mercy of God is my sin. It's precisely where there is death that Jesus is received more fully. Grace enters through the wounds. The wounds of our life, the wounds of our world, the wounds of my families, of our church. He enters through the wounds. He allows himself to be wounded and that grace to flow out from the sacred side and his wounds and his hands and feet and flow into us precisely where we are at death. That's exactly where he wants to rise, where he needs to rise. And so, first to receive. But it's not merely, especially for you who are called, <coughs> not willing to be priests. Because he says, let us go to him. Let us go to Lazarus. And so back to that first master, the one who loved is ill. For those who are called to the priesthood, pastoral charity must be the very mark of our existence. Jesus invites us to go with him to the poor, to the sick, to the weak, to the dying. He invites us, let us go. He does not send you out alone. Neither does he want to simply go alone. He will accompany us. He accompanies us in our weakness through others, priests and religious and others, our parents who have helped us. And he's forming you to not only receive, but also to be agents of that grace for others who need it. So that we can be with him in sharing his ministry. And that means that for us, especially now, our lives must be marked by prayer to receive and the prayer for others. Sacrifice for others. Holiness. Reparation. To pray for those who do not pray. To offer sacrifice, to fast. To do other sorts of sufferings and, and take on upon ourselves for those who do not fast. To cry, as it were, for those who do not cry, for those who do not know how dangerous their situation is. Generosity, even and especially for those who do not know that they need it, who think that they're fine, but in reality, they're peril, they're in peril. John Balthazar, from this on Balthazar, wrote a small work that is, I found very helpful in, it, in that he writes that the life I live can be of no other type than the love of the one who has died for me. I blossom on the grave of the one who died for me, and I sink my roots deep into the nourishing soil of his body and blood. This is what gives us our sustenance. This is what gives us our strength to be able to reach out to others when we are here and we're praying, Master, the one who loves ill, I believe, help me to go to them, even if in spirit, if I'm not, if I'm impeded physically. And all of this is possible because Jesus has come to us.
through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate to the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of our life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who I have spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our eyes fixed on Christ and on his crucifixion and resurrection. Let us bring before the Father all of our needs. We pray for our Holy Father, Pope Francis, for our Bishop Thomas, and for all of our bishops around the world, that they might be strong in proclaiming the gospel. We pray the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Our elected and appointed officials at every level of government, in our country and around the world, that they might work together effectively for peace and for a swift end to this pandemic, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all of those who are confined to their homes or watching this Mass on Facebook or YouTube, that they might experience the mercy, the love of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, for all of those who are throughout the world suffering, especially from the coronavirus, but also other illnesses, and for all of those who care for them. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For vocations to priesthood, that many young men will answer the call that the Lord is addressing to their hearts and respond with courage and confidence. And generosity, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Each one of you, for your studies, your continuing preparation for the priesthood, the brothers who are not able to be with us, and the seminarians around the country who have and whose interrupted studies have made it more difficult. But we ask and trust to Our Lady and her intercession. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. The intention we hold in our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, that they might rest in peace and rise in glory, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, our needs are many. Those we have spoken and those we carry in our hearts. Through the intercession of St. John Vianney and the Blessed Virgin Mary, grant the prayers that we bring before you with confidence. For we make them all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Hear us, Almighty God, and having instilled in your servants the teachings of the Christian faith, graciously purify them by the working of the sacrifice through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you.
May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O oh God, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your appeal to the Church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Thomas, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family, whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion and merciful heart, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to you and their passing from this life, give kind and diligence to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. To him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you are already there, and unite myself wholly to you, and never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Creo, Señor mío, que estás realmente presente en el Santísimo Sacramento del altar. Te amo sobre todas las cosas y deseo ardientemente recibirte dentro de mi alma. Pero no pudiendo hacerlo ahora sacramentalmente, ven al menos espiritualmente a mi corazón. Y como si te hubiese recibido, me abrazo y me uno todo a ti. Oh Señor, no permitas que me separe de ti. Amén.
Pray for more and holy vocations to the priesthood. It's at 7 o'clock on Thursday, first Thursday. And the reason why Thursday is because Thursday is the day that um, Jesus instituted the priesthood and the Holy Eucharist. And so um, this time of struggle, we are praying for and more and holy vocations to the priesthood um, and for uh, preparation for those who have harmed uh, others and with your spirit. Bless, O Lord, your people who long for the gift of your mercy, and grant that by it your prompting they desire, they may receive by your generous gifts through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and down in your name and through for us. Amen. Amen. The Master said, Go forth, glorifying the Lord by your lives. Thanks be to God. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, speaking the ruin of souls. Amen.